Okay, let's go and get started. Uh, I believe I am recording. So, uh, stuff today, my main plan is to finish bioenergetics and potentially get into exercise metabolism. If we uh, get to that, like we'll see, like I might uh, talk entirely too long about the Krebs cycle and uh, the electron transport chain. I hope not for uh, your benefit because I understand it can get kind of boring whenever I'm just uh, talking about dehydrogenase enzymes and things. Um, but going back just a little bit, just a little bit of review from glycolysis last time. Where in the cell is glycolysis happening? Let's think about that. Anybody have uh, a guess? So here, like I'm going to give you like two things to guess. It's either in the mitochondria or it's not in the mitochondria. Not, not, not. So I was trying to mouth it. I was trying to mouth it. Okay. So like, so the creatine phosphate stuff, uh, like uh, the, the whole thing with uh, taking mon uh, creatine monohydrate, that's happening in the cytoplasm. So is that myokinase reaction. That's also happening in the cytoplasm. Glycolysis, this 10-step thing that I only want you to know like four steps of, that's happening not in the mitochondria, meaning in the cytoplasm. And today, what I'm hoping to do is, well, like, get into what's happening in the mitochondria, which the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, whatever you want to call it, um, that's actually happening in the mitochondria. And that's where we're going to get the most bang for our buck, the most ATP that we possibly can. So here, these two phases of glycolysis, just going back to this really quick, um, in the energy investment phase, we lose two ATP at hexokinase, that sugar trap step, and PFK, the rate limiting enzyme. So we lose two there. And in the energy generation phase, we get four ATP and two NADHs. And I'll show you where that is, like, again, here in a second. <clears throat> but just take note of that. There's four ATP coming from there, two NADHs, and then we kind of end with two pyruvate or two lactate. Lactate being more anaerobic, we'll talk more about that. Pyruvate being more aerobic, meaning needing oxygen and things. So here, four ATP. In terms of net ATP gain, it's only two. Only two that we're getting from breaking down a molecule of glucose or sugar. So bear all that in mind whenever we're going forward. Here, this, this reaction, Big thing that I want you to know here is we're taking a phosphate from ATP and we're putting it on glucose. And that's going to make it stay in the cell. Hexokinase, you need to know that enzyme. That's coming up numerous times. It's called glucokinase in the liver, hexokinase because we only care about biceps in here. Next thing, next thing. That, that top one right there, hexokinase, we already know that. Uh, PFK. Big thing here, like what I want you to know, and, and like on, on exams and on pop quizzes, acronyms are fine. PFK, because phosphofructokinase, that's a nonsense word, right? PFK, it's good enough, right? Okay, so PFK, what's happening here? We already have functionally that glucose molecule going down in these steps, and it's C6, like six carbons. It has a phosphate on it. At the PFK reaction, we're throwing another phosphate on it. Everyone good with that? So we're consuming an ATP there. Why do I do that? Um, uh, next things, in the energy generation phase. Big things that we need to know. We need to know where all the big stuff is happening. That was redundant, but whatever, whatever. Most people aren't listening anyway, that's okay. Um, Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This one, it's a dehydrogenase reaction because we're taking a hydrogen off of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and we're putting on that electron carrier, that NAD, to make NADH. That's going to end up going to the mitochondria to generate more ATP. Well, more on that later. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And uh, I was talking to Matt, what, uh, like, what do we like? G3PDH? Is that a good acronym for this? So G3PDH. How about that for an acronym there? Because spelling glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, well, this is an English class, or Latin, I guess. Um, next thing, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. <coughs> we're taking one of those uh, phosphates off of it, and we're putting it onto an ADP to get an ATP. And notice there's one on both sides, so there's two that we're getting at that part of the reaction. 
and it's called phosphoglycerate kinase. So remember, kinase, that's adding a phosphate. Dehydrogenase is taking away a hydrogen. So it kind of is telling you what's going on, right? Uh, next thing, from phosphoenyl pyruvate to pyruvate, two ATPs that we're getting pyruvate kinase. That's the enzyme there, right? Everyone good with this, right? Now, like, I know it's a lot of stuff. That's why I, I went over it again. Like, watch this YouTube video a thousand times or whatever. Uh, yeah, it would get my uh, view count up. That would be fun. Making money. Right, yeah. It's, uh, and this, this ad is brought to you by MeUndies. So, okay. Moving on. Um, okay, so hydrogen electron carriers. Um, which please unsubscribe to me if you're subscribed. That's ridiculous, it's kind of weird. Um, but uh, they transport hydrogens and associated electrons. They're going into the mitochondria. Now, it's to the mitochondria for ATP generation, and we can also drop it off into this particular enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase to convert pyruvate into lactate, or lactic acid, you know, because that's the muscle variant. And I'll, I'll show you that here in a little bit. But overall, like NAD, that's essentially what's going on. FAD, that's going to come up in uh, the Krebs cycle here in a little bit. So something about this. NAD, the electron shuttle, we only have so much of these in the cytoplasm. So we can get backlogged, and if they're all taken up, then glycolysis can't run, we can't generate any more energy. So we effectively need to free up the NAD, H, somehow, some way. So uh, one way is taking it into the mitochondria to like do like oxidative phosphorylation or to drop it off with lactate dehydrogenase uh, to form lactic acid. So here are effectively two different ways how it can be dropped off into the mitochondria. Now, this, I just want you to be aware that this is a thing. We're not going to memorize any of these steps. But there's this uh, malate aspartate shuttle and there's this glycerol, uh, glycerol phosphate shuttle. That's probably not going to come up much anymore. Like in biochemistry classes, I'm sure it comes up a lot. They're relatively busy, but I, I like showing this because this is happening in the cytoplasm. That's happening in the mitochondria. Hopefully everyone sees that, right? So like, we need to take those NADHs from you know, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase and put it into the mitochondria. And later we'll see how many ATP we get out of NADHs. Uh, I, I think it's uh, kind of cool. Now here, if we need energy now and we don't have time to make energy aerobically, this is what happens. So pyruvate or pyruvic acid, whatever we want to think about, this LDH enzyme, that's lactate dehydrogenase, we will drop these hydrogens into here and convert pyruvate to lactate. So effectively, the reason why we like, make lactate is to prolong how long glycolysis can actually go. Is everyone good with this? OK, so like, here's, here's something I want you to think about. Uh, and I'm certain I'm going to say this again at some point. So, uh, like, here's kind of the first run through with it. Who's heard that <clears throat> lactic acid causes, like, that burn in your muscles? Most of us, right? Muscle soreness, lactic acid, right? Right? Everyone's heard this? Nonsense. That's not at all what's happening. And it's fairly simple. I just want you to look at this. What's actually causing the soreness is hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions, that's what acid is, right? Hydrochloric acid, all that type of stuff. So here, let's look at the pyru uh, pyruvate. How many hydrogens are on that molecule? Can anyone count for me? Three, right. Now, in lactate, how many are on that molecule? Uh, uh, count the OH as well. How many are on that? Anybody? Oh, two, five, right, on lactate? One, two, three, four, five, right? So five on lactate. So what lactate is actually doing, it's reducing the acidity of a cell, 
right? So lactate is actually reducing that burning sensation that you're feeling whenever you're doing like the wind gate or whatever that we're doing in class, right? Everyone see this? So next time someone says, oh, I need to get the lactic acid out of my muscles, and like lactic acid is causing this burning sensation, hit them with a shovel because they don't know what they're talking about. They never read anything. What's up, Anna? Oh, because the acidity is just the uh, like free hydrogen ions like in the solution of the cytosol, right? So it's being bound up to this molecule, and effectively it's going to be transported out. Does that make sense? Right? No, like that was a really good question from Hannah. So like effectively, like it's coming from like here's in the cytosol, we're putting it on that to get rid of it, more or less. Everyone good with this? That makes sense. And this is this is from the mouth of uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Gladden. So like I, I, beautiful man, beautiful man. So, all right, moving, moving on a little bit. Now let's go into like aerobic ATP production. Now we're getting into the mitochondria. So I'll typically call it the Krebs cycle, Hans Krebs, because that's how I learned it. I think in most textbooks these days they're calling it the citric acid cycle because like there's a, a citrate molecule and a citrate synthase is the first enzyme in the, this whole cycle of it. But um, <coughs> uh, I, I'll go back and forth in whatever I call it uh, there. So just, just be aware of that. First things to know, pyruvic acid. It's three carbons. We lose a carbon dioxide right here. So acetyl-CoA, that's two carbons. <laughs> That, like that two carbons is going to be really important. Acetyl-CoA combines with a four carbon oxaloacetate, frequently notated OAA, all capital, to form citrate, which is six carbons. And we're going to see where the other carbons are actually taken off. So citrate is metabolized into oxaloacetate, like through a series of like that cyclic Krebs cycle like reaction thing. And they make like an ATP in the end of it. This is where we get the majority of our electron carriers. So NADHs and FADHs. And there's a bunch of enzymes here that I want us to know. So here, I want you to think about oxidative phosphorylation, which is just the production of ATP oxidatively or aerobically using oxygen to do it. Right? Is everyone good with this? There's effectively three stages of it. That first one right there is the conversion of something. In this class, we're mostly concerned with pyruvate, which is at the very end of glycolysis, into acetyl-CoA. Now, we can make other things into acetyl-CoA. Uh, fats, that's a process called beta oxidation. I'm actually going to tell you more about that than you probably want to know. We can also make amino acids, or let, you know the breakdown products of protein, into acetyl-CoA. But pyruvate is the main one that we're concerned about. So pyruvate, three carbons, that CO2, it's coming off, and then right there, two carbons and acetyl-CoA. Hopefully everyone's good with that. The next thing is effectively the oxidation. So oxidation is losing, right? Losing of electrons. Oxidation of acetyl-CoA, that's the second stage of this. And then the third stage is the electron transport chain. That's where we're going to make all the money, all of the ATP. Not all of it, the, the vast majority of it. Is everyone with those three stages? Pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, then the oxidation of acetyl-CoA, and then, essentially, the harvesting of all the electron carriers in order to make ATP. And ATP is the currency, the fuel that like, makes your muscles contract, makes your enzymes work, all sorts of stuff. Right? Everyone good with this? Okay. Now here, a bunch of enzymes that I want us to know. Pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, it's an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And I think this should make sense because we're taking an NAD and we're adding hydrogen to it. So this is one of our electron carriers that we get. Everyone good with that? Pyruvate dehydrogenase. That's the enzyme right there. So pyruvate, spell pyruvate, I think all of us can learn how to do that. DH, it's good enough for me. That, it's actually a really busy uh, like reaction, 
with like thymine pyrophosphate and things. I'll show you that on like the next slide, I believe. Um, but for purposes of this class, I just want to prove a dehydrogenase, and we're getting an NADH there. That will give us acetyl CoA from pyruvate. Next thing, next thing, oxaloacetate through citrate synthase and acetyl CoA gets converted into citrate. You don't need to know that reaction. That reaction isn't abundantly important to me. And citrate into isocitrate, also not super important to me. This one is, though, because we're getting an NADH and we're losing a carbon dioxide there. So going back just a little bit, oxaloacetate, that's got four carbons. Acetyl-CoA, that's got two. We put that together. Citrate has six. Isocitrate has six. We lose one now. And then we go to like alpha ketoglutarate, that's got five. But the enzyme there, isocitrate dehydrogenase, really the big stuff I want you to know is we're converting isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate with isocitrate dehydrogenase, and we're losing a CO2, and we're gaining an NADH. So dehydrogenase, removing an electron or hydrogen. Everyone good with this? Also write this down. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is the rate-limiting enzyme or rate-limiting step in the citric acid cycle. And we'll talk more about rate-limiting steps uh, like a little bit later. But effectively, that the rate that this reaction goes controls overall how fast this whole like Krebs cycle, like energetic pathway is going. Kind of like PFK. The faster PFK goes, the faster glycolysis goes. OK, so isocitrate dehydrogenase, we need to know that enzyme. Next one, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. We need to know this one too. Essentially, the same thing is happening as in the isocitrate dehydrogenase reaction. We're getting an NADH, and we're losing a carbon dioxide. Everyone good with this? Right? So same song and dance I gave you. Uh, we need that right here. Next thing, you don't need to know this, this enzyme in particular, succinyl-CoA synthetase. You don't need to know this. I just want you to know at essentially the bottom, how it's always pictorially like represented, we're getting an ATP. Everyone good with this? Right? We're getting an ATP down there. Next one, succinate dehydrogenase. This one is important because we're getting an FAD here. An FAD is different than NAD. It yields less ATP overall. I'm going to show you that. There's numbers that I'm going to want you to memorize. And that 3 and 1 are not those numbers. So this one, succinate and defumerate. And we're getting an FAD. H, FADH, I'm sorry, FADH. Now, we're not losing any more carbon dioxides because, hey, we're already down to the four, and that's what oxaloacetate has to be. So we're not losing any more of those, uh, like, carbons. Next one, very last one, malate dehydrogenase. Right here, malate into oxaloacetate, OAA. We're yielding an NAD, or NADH. Two things to bear in mind here. At the bottom, like with glycolysis, do you remember how it went down into two branches, right? How we got two pyruvate at the very end of it? Don't lose sight that all of this happens twice from a glucose molecule. So we get like two acetyl-CoA, we get two NADHs right there, two NADHs right there, two ATP right there, two FADHs, and two NADHs right there. So don't for lose, lose sight of that. So all of this is, uh, I, I don't know, like it's, uh, I think it should be the 11th commandment that the citric acid cycle always goes twice. Everyone good with that? 11th commandment, write it down, cool. Moses from on high. All right, good, good. There we go there. That's more or less all I want you to know with this. Also keep in mind that it's happening like within the mitochondria. Within the mitochondria. So here, this is the whole pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. And if you're interested, this is where we're 
uh, getting that NADH, and that's where we're getting that acetyl-CoA from. I'm not going to test you on this. Just I wanted to point out a particular thing. One of the B vitamins, thiamine. Where is that? Thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP. Part of the idea of energy drinks, why it gives you a lot of thiamine in them, is that, oh, like, hey, potentially, we can make this whole pyruvate dehydrogenase thing go faster if we have more thiamine. Because thiamine is, you know, it's an energetic, water-soluble vitamin. Is that interesting, nobody? Like, that's, that's how, like, monsters and rock stars are formulated. They're like, oh, I think this works, right? It probably doesn't, but I, I think it's kind of cool anyway. All right, moving on. Fats and proteins and aerobic metabolism. So fats, triglycerides, yield in glycerol and fatty acids. Fatty acids are broken down into acetyl-CoA to get into the Krebs cycle through a process called beta oxidation. We need to know that. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about beta oxidation as it goes on. Glycerol. For the muscle, and hopefully you remember, glycerol is essentially just hydrogen and carbon. For the muscle, it's not a really important fuel, but in the liver, we can actually convert that into different intermediates to make glucose out of it. Phosphoglyceraldehyde and things. I'll, I'll show you that. What's up? Glycerol is the one you're saying? Yes, glycerol. Glycerol. Glycerol can be converted into glucose. Protein. So they're broken down into amino acids, right? Bless you. And then they can be converted into glucose, mostly in the liver. Mostly in the liver. Pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA, or various Krebs cycle intermediates. Like uh, succinyl-CoA uh, would be one of the main ones that the branch chain amino acids go into. But like, I'll show you that here in a second. And like, there's a particular enzyme I want you to know there. So this, this picture. Just overall, seeing where these things are able to go. So the glucose and the glycogen, that, that's all, all up here at the top. That's the typical pathway of creating pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, going through the Krebs cycle, all of that stuff. Triglycerides, or you know, fats, it goes in on potentially the glycerol, like after we break that apart, the, like the glycerol and the three fatty acids, that glycerol can go into phosphoglyceraldehyde. But this one is really the business, fatty acids and acetyl-CoA. That's really like the main one, like whenever we're talking about your body burning fat for fuel, whenever you're exercising, like, like in lab how we calculate like someone's fat max and stuff, that's really what's happening. It's like how quickly can we get fatty acids into acetyl-CoA. So something interesting here. I've been talking about carbon link with fatty acids and the amount of uh, um, uh, carbons that acetyl-CoA is. So fatty acids, they're like 16, 18, 12 for lauric acid, uh, different stuff like that. Acetyl-CoA is two carbons. So whenever we read on the back of like a nutrition label that like, I don't know, like a gram of fat is nine calories, that's actually not right. It's actually kind of variable based upon how many carbons are in it. Is everyone good with this, right? Like the 12 carbon, lauric acid, Oxidize very quickly, saturated fat, very quickly. We don't get as much energy out of that as like the 18 carbon, like olive oil oleic acid, right? Everyone good with that? That makes sense generally, right? Okay, good. So just kind of a point there. So like all fats aren't equal, so, uh, uh, so to speak. Moving on there. Next thing, aerobic ATP production, electron transport chain stuff. So oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the mitochondria, right? So this is after the Krebs cycle, where we're getting NADHs and FADHs. Effectively, there's like five proteins that are lodged within part of the mitochondrial bean. I'm going to show you a picture of that here soon. That we drop these NADHs off, or FADHs, at different parts. We put hydrogen in this like, uh, like intermembrane space, and we cross, like, like uh, I don't know, essentially trade off like electrons along these proteins in order to make a lot of ATP. So here are the two big numbers I want you to know. NADH, for each one, we get 2.5 ATP. 
Oh, you looked inquisitive. Okay, that's um. Uh, now, whenever I was initially going through this, they said three ATP for an NADH. And just just so you know, like it might be a little bit variable, like uh, like with the age of textbooks and like actually going into the future. But in this class, I just want you to know 2.5 and 1.5 for FADH. There's some complex math here, but uh, uh, I'm not going to cover it in this class because I'm already asking you to memorize a lot. Um, and effectively, how we make ATP from these NADHs, like effectively the hydrogens and electrons, it's called the chemiosmotic hypothesis. And here is essentially the definition for that. So chemiosmosis is the movement of ions across like a semi-permeable membrane down an, electrical, uh, an electrochemical gradient. So you know how like waterfalls go downhill? I'm going to show you something and like how waterfalls go down. I want you to think about hydrogen ions doing that. So we'll get into that soon. Once I see people writing a little bit less. Excellent. Everyone good copying this down? You good, Ari? Hell yeah. Cool. Rock on. Moving on to this. So the chemiosmotic hypothesis of ATP formation, I'm just going to read this to you. Electron transport chain results in pumping hydrogen ions across the intermitochondrial membrane. It results in a gradient. I'm, like, I'm going to show you the picture here. It's going to make a lot more sense whenever we do it that way. And it gets into this particular space of the mitochondria where it has a lot of potential energy. And things typically go from high concentrations to low concentrations. And whenever it falls down this gradient, the energy is harnessed to throw together the ADP and phosphate. That is essentially just circulating in the mitochondrial matrix. So this is how it looks. Here, this is the mitochondria, and this is the electron transport chain. So we have a lot of uh, uh, different proteins that are lodged. Proteins or enzymes, whatever you want to call them, lodged inside of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, it's got like two layers to it. There's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. This is what's happening. We're taking these NADHs uh, here and FADHs in complex two. We're putting a lot of hydrogens through there into this intermembrane space. So that intermembrane space has a lot of hydrogens in it. Tons. It's one of the most acidic places in your body. Throwing a lot of them in there. That's where all the hydrogens are. Now, the electrons. Electrons are passed along these complexes. Complex 1, 2, 3, 4. And then complex 5 is ATP synthase. The electrons are transported along there to effectively change the shape of those proteins or enzymes in order to open them up to get more hydrogen ions in and eventually, at ATP synthase, allow all these hydrogen ions that are within that inner mitochondrial membrane to fall down this gradient like water going downhill. And that energy of them falling is enough chemical energy to put together ADP and then organic phosphate, and we get ATP there. Everyone good with that? Right? Another thing that I want you to be aware of, what's accepting that hydrogen at the very bottom is typically an ion of oxygen. So we make water right there. So part of the process of breaking down a lot, or like really forming a lot of ATP, we form something called metabolic water. And uh, uh, like oxygen is the final hydrogen ion or electron acceptor. So that's kind of what's going on there, right? So everyone good with this? That is how we make energy to 
run marathons, lift weights, break dance, whatever you people do. Right? Cool. Now, let's go and move on a little bit to beta oxidation. I'm going to give you a little bit more of this than what you want. So I said before, we're going to need to know what beta oxidation is. Uh, here, this first bullet point here, breakdown of triglycerides, uh, releases fatty acids. That's called lipolysis overall. So breakdown of triglycerides to get fatty acids, that's called lipolysis. And fatty acids being converted into acetyl-CoA, that is the process called beta oxidation. So make sure that you get those words right. Getting fat out of a fat cell is called lipolysis. Making acetyl-CoA and subsequently ATP out of it, that's beta oxidation. So acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle and is used for energy. So being chopped into two carbon fragments, right? OK. In most exercise physiology textbooks, and a lot of textbooks uh, in particular, this is just about the only, uh, gosh, graph or like, uh, like pictorial representation of how we actually get energy out of fat. So really, like free fatty acids, think like you broke them out of like fat cells, and it's circulating in your blood. It gets into the muscle cell somehow, some way. And uh, like then it gets transported into the, uh, uh, the mitochondria. And then down a little bit, we get beta oxidation. Then it goes into acetyl-CoA. Then Krebs cycle and electron transfer chain are just like how glucose works. I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of those like earlier parts. So first thing, first thing here. And I don't believe you all have this. Do you all have this? I don't know. OK, cool. So how fats get into a muscle cell to be burned? Main thing I want you to know here, it's called fatty acid translocase or CD36. Fatty acid translocase, acronym, all capital, FAT. So FAT, everyone do that. Fat, it's getting fat inside of a muscle cell, right? Right, it's like they knew what they were naming, or they were doing it. Now that's for longer chain fatty acids. I mean the ones that are like 16 carbons in length, 18 carbons in length, 20, so on and so forth. Why I was talking about medium chain fats uniquely, like 12 carbon down to like six, I think is what I showed you. Um, eight is normally how I think about it with the capric and caprylic acids. But those don't need a transporter to get into a muscle cell. So here's an idea. If you take medium chain triglycerides or medium chain fats, or eat some coconut oil or whatever, we might be able to get around all of this because of that whole process of getting fats in there takes time, right? So if we take some MCT oil or whatever, we can get the fats inside of the like muscle cell faster so we can burn them sooner. And if we burn those instead of other fuels that we could burn, like say glycogen or whatever, we might be able to preserve glycogen and at the end of a race be able to like kick harder or burn more glycogen at that time. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? So the length of like a particular fat, you know, like it dictates how it gets into the cell. And then it goes through this whole like beta oxidation process, pretty cool stuff. Right? So the main two things I want you to know here. Medium and short chain fats diffuse right into a muscle cell. They actually go through hepatic metabolism rather than lymphatic metabolism, or like uh, transport too. Uh, but I'm not going to test you on that. And the longer chain ones, 16 carbons or longer typically, probably 14 carbon mysteric acid probably, um, that has to go through fatty acid translocase or CD36. It's you, both of those mean the same thing. Like, in fact, it's frequently written, like, uh, like I'll, I'll draw it. In books, that's normally how it's written. But you can pick either one. I don't really care. So there, that's how that works. 
something interesting. Fatty acid translocase. It's not just in the cell membrane of the muscle. It actually has to get activated. So here's what's going on here. So we have these fatty acid translocase cluster differential 36 just inside of the cytosol, just circulating around. You do a bunch of muscle contractions and say your biceps, your quads, or face, whatever you're using. Like, like right now, your eyebrow muscles to like keep your eyes open, right? That's what everyone's doing. You're getting fatty acid translocase to go to those muscles. Then it goes from there into the, uh, the, the cell membrane so that fats will go in right there. Does that make sense? Is that kind of cool? Another one that I want you to know, GLUT4. GLUT4, that one's for glucose. So there's a couple of different glutes. So um, uh, glucose translocase is what that stands for. But GLUT4 in like, is the really important one. Both of these are activated by muscle contractions to be like, hey, this muscle needs fuel. So transporters go to the surface of a muscle so that the fuel will go to that muscle. Like if you're doing a bunch of bicep curls, do we need more fuel in your quads? No should be the answer. Um, so they will, they will selectively go to where they're needed. And that muscle contraction sends that signal. Isn't that cool to anybody? No? OK, it's not. It's cool to me. Cool to me. Moving on. Uh, we need to know about these. Um, uh, here, just like a different representation of uh, like the, uh, effectively how a fat gets inside of a cell, the main thing I want you to know here is that the enzymes that are important for this to get it like into the mitochondria are called carnitine acetyltransferase, or you can also call it carnitine palmetto transferase, collectively called the carnitine shuttle, like all, all of these different things. So going back like fatty acid, uh, translocase, CD36, that gets us into the muscle. This whole carnitine system, that gets us into the mitochondria. Everyone good with this? And then oxidation is essentially happening there. Cool? Um, here, I'm going to go ahead and stop here and we'll have a pop quiz. Cool? Oh, well, of course it's not cool, but you know, we have to do it. So, all right. <laughs>